Somewhere in America, the United States is developing hundreds of recruits for this specialized service. And picked with the aid of Army and Navy intelligence facilities, the men are taken under guard to the secret training camp which is to be their home for the weeks to follow. The area is located high in an eastern mountain range, miles from the nearest village, and under constant guard by U.S. soldiers and Marines. This isolated, heavily wooded terrain offers an excellent proving ground for the student of guerrilla tactics. Classes are limited to less than a dozen men, thus ensuring the utmost security and providing almost individual instruction for each student. From the moment of their induction, the identities of the recruits remain a carefully guarded secret, which explains the use of masks in this film. From whence they came, or for what perilous mission they're being prepared, is the concern of nobody at camp. In this group, there are some who speak very little English. One of them has fought in four wars. Two of them are veteran guerrillas from the Spanish Loyalist forces. Several have seen their relatives and friends die at the hands of the enemy. But all of them have this in common. They burn with a desire for vengeance and they mean to deal it out as it was given, at close quarters with no holes barred. After the senior instructor has delivered a short induction speech, he presents each man with an identification badge bearing a first name only. From this point onward, the students are known by officers and fellow recruits merely as Student Jack or Student Fred or whatever name has been assigned them. They will be confined at all times to the camp area and when they finally leave, it will be to proceed immediately and incommunicado to the conveyance that takes them to the scene of action. Every item of personal equipment is supplied by the government. The men arrive without so much as a toothbrush or pencil. During this training period, emphasis is put on close association among members of the same student group. An expert guerrilla or saboteur must not only think and act quickly for himself, but must almost anticipate the next action of his colleague. Individual quarters are hidden in the woods, and the students are taught to live in seclusion, in conditions simulating those they may encounter as guerrillas behind enemy lines. This outdoor trainasium was carefully constructed to develop muscles most used in individual close combat. In fact, the first principle of commando or guerrilla training evolves from the theory that the best defense is a good offense. Hit first and talk afterwards. In short, get tough. And in the business of getting tough, there is certainly no better comp There are no Marquis of Queensbury rules in guerrilla warfare. It's a simple matter of kill or be killed, capture or be captured. In this phase of the instruction period, the student is taught the gentle art of murder, the technique of killing or crippling his opponent with his two hands at close quarters. The success of this system of close combat has little to do with size or strength. The larger man here should have little trouble tossing the smaller one around. Yet by the pressure of one finger in the right spot, he is rendered powerless. The same theory applies to all the holes in this course. Most valuable offensive blow at close quarters is the chin jab. The hand is held open at shoulder height, and the blow is delivered to the opponent's chin with all the weight of the body in the follow through. Another excellent weapon is the edge of the hand. Keep the fingers tight together, thumb erect. The blow is a sharp slash with follow through. Apart from the commando knife, 
which is considered in the later part of the training course, there are several hand weapons of inestimable value in guerrilla warfare. One of these is the Kosh, spelled K-O-S-H. The hitting end is a lead weight, which telescopes into a small cylinder secured up the sleeve by a wrist thong. In preparing for action, the cylinder is dropped into the palm of the hand and the actual blow is delivered as a sidearm throw. Centrifugal force drives the lead weight out to the end of the spring. A properly delivered blow to the side of the head will cause a skull fracture and possibly death. The smatchet is a heavy knife of extreme killing power, beautifully balanced and capable of lethal action either with the point, blade, or pommel. The Derringer, a tiny single-shot pistol which can be concealed in the palm of the hand or up the sleeve, may be the difference between life and death in an emergency. Most methods of disarming are equally applicable to all types of sidearms, but the following are believed to be better adapted to use against the revolver. Here is the simplest defense of all, a quick blow with the edge of the hand across the wrist possibly breaking it. Another disarm from the front. Seize the wrist in one hand, and with the other, twist the pistol against your opponent's fingers. In some cases, this maneuver works better. Grab the gun in one hand, strike the wrist sharply with the other, at the same time pulling the weapon free. A very simple and effective means of reducing the homicide rate when revolvers are used. Merely clutch the cylinder and hold it securely. As long as the cylinder can't turn, the gun can't fire. This is not a good idea if the gun is cocked or of the single action variety. After a few weeks of preliminary training, the student is told to report alone to the pistol house, a mysterious structure he has never before entered. In the anteroom, the instructor gives him his problem. A group of enemy saboteurs are active in the neighborhood, taking a heavy toll of life and property. The student is to make contact and to maintain it until either he or the enemy is wiped out. Watch your stuff on these stairs. Look out for that corner. 
kick the door down. And when you do, get him. That's right. Look out for this flooring. It's bad. I'll fall now. In the final stages of training, the students are given night problems which are designed to correlate all they've learned of close combat, reconnaissance, pistol and knife technique, and demolition. In every detail, the same care is taken to simulate combat conditions, and each student is required to familiarize himself with the uniforms, signs, and languages he will encounter in actual guerrilla raids overseas. Herr Oberst, ich hatte mit äh, Herrn Major Klause hier eine lange Unterredung. Und äh, wir kommen uns ganz überein, dass der Feind hier entweder Saboteure oder Kommandotruppen gelandet hat. Nicht wahr, Herr Major? Jawohl. Ja. Gut, nun. Also Herr Oberst, äh, wenn Sie mal hierher sehen, die Küste, nicht wahr? Die Küste hier bietet ausgezeichnete Gelegenheit, ganz nahe an unsere Gegend heranzukommen. Also Fallschirme gibt es überhaupt nicht. Und der Seeboote, ja. 